Decisions determine your life. Have you discovered that yet? There are decisions that you make every day that determine, if you make wise decisions, then they will lead you down a path of order and fulfillment. Make unwise decisions, they'll lead you down a path of chaos and regret. And part of the tricky thing is you're never quite sure which decisions are going to matter most. For instance, years ago, about 25 years ago, Laura Bennett decided that she was going to go up to the lake once more in August before the summer was over, but she didn't have a way to get there. So she called her friend, Laura Barrick, who had a car and said, hey, Laura, would you like to go six hours away, five and a half hours away up to the lake with me? Well, Laura Barrick had never been there before, and she had other things that she could do, but she thought, I'll do a good friendly deed, and yeah, I will go up to the lake with Laura Bennett. And about six hours later, I was standing on my back porch, looking eye to eye, gazing into the woman of my dreams, the woman that I would marry. Laura Barrick became Laura Andrews. She thought she was going to the lake for a few days. She didn't realize she was getting locked into a lifetime commitment. You never know what decisions are going to have the greatest impact in your life. And that's part of the whole tricky deal, okay? Decisions determine your life. We're always making decisions, and we're not quite sure. Are these the right priorities or not? Am I disciplining my child enough, or or am I being too harsh with them? Am I, uh, should I invest here, or should I not? Should I hire this person, or should I not? Should I trust this person, or should I not? Is Is this the kind of person that I should date? Or more importantly, is this the kind of person that I should let date my daughter? Or should I buy some fresh ammo for my shotgun? You know, kind of. What should I do there? Well, I don't know what that means. I was getting the the fist pump back there. Yes. Okay, all right. All right, so we are making all kinds of decisions. Every day you make thousands of decisions. Most of the options are legal. Many of them are moral. But not all of them are wise. So the question is, how do I make wise decisions with my life? If you're a follower of Jesus Christ or if you believe in God, then you believe that God has made me for a purpose. And so the question for us becomes, how can I make decisions that are consistent with God's purpose and ultimate will for my life? Okay, that's why we're going to take a look at this movie, The Adjustment Bureau. While it doesn't put it quite in those theological terms, the essence, the essential question of The Adjustment Bureau is, how much influence do I have in my life? Is my life fixed or do I have choices that can actually make a difference? If you're not familiar, to bring you up to speed with the Adjustment Bureau, the Adjustment Bureau tells the story of an up-and-coming New York State State representative by the name of Jason Bourne. (laughs) No, wrong movie. By by the name of David Morris. Once you've seen the Bourne movies, it's kind of hard to see him anything else. Uh, But anyway, as the story goes on, um, he's about to, at the beginning of the story, he's about to win an election for a senatorial campaign And what we discover later on is that according to the plan, this is actually just a next step that will ultimately lead him to the Oval Office itself. That's the plan. That's what the fates have determined. The fates are determined in the Adjustment Bureau by a guy known as the chairman. This kind of all powerful, at least mostly powerful, not quite benevolent dictator who has a plan for everybody's life And he has a group of minions whose purpose is to keep people on the plan. Those minions, those are the fedora-wearing, secret service-looking characters, okay, known as the Adjustment Bureau. And David Morris is fine with the plan of the chairman, as long as it's just about his political life. But then one day, he runs into Elise. The first meeting is by design, 
but then they run into each other again a second time by chance. He gets off the plan. And this time, it's very clear that they have fallen deeply into like with each other, okay? I mean, they just, the romance flies. But the problem is, this isn't according to plan. They're not supposed to fall in love. And David is being informed, as you saw there, that if he follows her and pursues that love, that it will ruin her plan and his plan. He'll, he may never be president of the United States. And what's he going to do? And the question asked by the movie and the question that we wrestle with in our lives is how much control do I have over my destiny? Is everything predetermined or do choices matter? If some of you took psychology years ago, you remember there was a, this is a big question in psychology. Are we just the result of, of, of the natural world and we are just kind of me- mechanical beings and so there's really no free will there's a whole philosophy out there that says no we don't have free will free will is just an illusion a delusion for us so what i want to do this morning is to i want to ask you to think deeply with me for a little bit now the good news is i can't think that deeply so you don't have to think that deeply okay but we're going to think a little bit deeply a little bit deeplier today a little bit deeply. hang on though because it's not just it's real practical stuff uh, I want you to know up front that I'm leaning pretty heavily on the work of Jack Cottrell and Tim Keller for this message. And the question if we ask, how does God guide so that I'm living a plan according that is, that is going to be blessed by God or is a, according to the purpose for which I've made? The question then, first of all, becomes how does God guide? And Tim Keller says, God guides paradoxically. First thing you need to understand, I would actually say God guides oxymoronically. An oxymoron is something that doesn't seem right at first, but the more you think about it, the more you think, oh, that makes sense. Okay, that's how God guides. Proverbs 21, verse 5. On the one hand, the Bible says, the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. If that's the only scripture that we have in the Bible, that says your choices determine your future. You can uh, change the word hasty to impulsive, Change the word diligent to strategic or thoughtful or reflective. And the idea there is that God, that strategic planning done the right way will lead to blessing, will lead to good results, much better than just impulsively living, okay? So that would say your choices are your choices, they have consequences. You determine your destiny. Now balance that though with Proverbs 16.33 that says, The lot is cast into the lap, but it's every decision is from the Lord. Now, lot casting would be kind of like for us rolling the dice or flipping a coin. It was like these sticks sort of things that were, I don't know quite how it worked, except if the NFL were being played in the ancient Near East, they wouldn't, uh, imagine them being in the middle of the field, they wouldn't flip a coin, they would cast lots, and whoever wins the lot casting deal gets to kick off first or receive first or whatever. Okay, with that in mind, read that proverb again. Proverbs 16.33 says, The lot is cast into the lap, but its every decision is from the Lord. That says every detail, whether it's the rolling of the dice, the flip of the coin, okay, it's from the Lord. It happens the way God wants it to. Now, how do you harmonize these two truths? On the one hand, your choices, if if you're impulsive, you're gonna have bad results. If you plan and are strategic, you're gonna have better results. Your choices matter. On the other hand, every flip of the coin is determined by God. Now, that's hard for us to make sense, isn't it? I mean, our human minds have a hard time with that logic. It seems to us it's it's gotta be one way or the other. I mean, either we have free will and our choices determine the future, or God is sovereign, and he controls how everything, um, you know, uh, uh, is determined. Either we have choices and those choices matter, or everything is fixed. You know, the chairman has a plan. But here's the deal. The Bible doesn't draw the categories that distinctly. Okay, God's wisdom somehow is beyond ours, and God says both are true. Yes, you are responsible in your choices influence, And yes, God is still sovereign. Listen to how it's described in Proverbs 16.1. The plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. Your plans belong to you, but the answer, God's in control. Uh, Proverbs 16.9. The heart 
of a man plans his ways, but the Lord establishes his steps. So you see what that's saying? You do something smart, like investing in Apple computer stock in December of 1980 when it's first released, and you get good consequences, and that's yours. Yeah, you. You do something stupid, like betting on the Redskins to win the Super Bowl? <laughs> in the next decade? <laughs> and that's foolishness, and the consequences belong to you. You can't blame that on somebody else. You can't blame that on chance. You're responsible, okay? However, whatever happens, whether it happens in history, whether it's the answering of the tongue, Proverbs 16.3, or the executing of your plans, Proverbs, 19, Proverbs 6, nine. I'm sorry, 16.9, ultimately it's controlled by God. 100% our choice, 100% God is in control. 100% you are responsible, 100% God is sovereign. It's not 50-50, it's not 60-40. You know why it really matters? Because if you feel like it's one way or the other, if you believe in one extreme or the other, you're cooked. For instance, if you believe everything is fixed, and has no connection to what you do, you will become passive and lack initiative. Some people on the extreme here theologically, we would call them extreme Calvinists or or Augustinians. Example of that is a woman that I knew um, years ago whose son was living an awful immoral life. He'd he'd left his wife, he was uh, being sexually immoral, he was doing drugs, completely disconnected from the church, running from God. But the mom wasn't taking any kind of action, wasn't trying to have any kind of influence, because she said when he was in high school, he gave his heart to Jesus Christ, and she knows he was saved, therefore she knows that God is going to bring him back. That's extreme Calvinism. I don't have to do anything, because it's all part of God's plan. God's going to do it all, so I don't have responsibility. On the other hand, if like most people in the United States culture, you tend to believe that your destiny is completely up to you, determined by you, then you'll have one of three responses, at at least, three responses that I see are clear. The one is arrogance. You know, the Bible says that every good and perfect gift comes from above, from the Father of the heavenly lights. But if you think that all good things come from you, that it's all a result of your decisions and your actions, then when good things happen, you're not going to say, God's been really good to me. You're going to say, I'm a really good person. In fact, I'm a better person than they are because I've achieved them. Arrogance is one result that you believe it's all about you. Second result is anxiety. Because you find yourself in a situation that is beyond your control, and bad stuff's happening, and so you beat yourself up because it's all your fault and you're out of control and there's no God in the universe to be able to trust. And so you're anxious because it's like you don't believe there's a heavenly father who cares for you. The third result is, and this is the one that we don't really live out, but we would, if you really believe that your, de- your destiny is determined by your decisions, you wouldn't make any decisions. You wouldn't get out of bed in the morning. I mean, just think about all the wrong decisions you make every day. Think about when you were 18 years old. Some of you I know project this into the future. But imagine when you're, how many, what percentage of right decisions do you think I made when I was 18, 19 years old? I'm guessing maybe one out of three. Okay? If I made one out of three decisions that were right at that point, I was probably doing pretty well. If everything happened according to my control, if I determined my destiny, I would be married to Mrs. Wrong right now. You know, because there was this girl that I was deeply in like with in college, and she dumped me, and it crushed me. I fasted, and I prayed, and I was like, God, no, don't let this happen. Help, you know, and boy, am I glad that that decision wasn't determined by me, that God's in control, okay? Now, here's the scary part. What do you think my percentage is now? 15, thank you. Going the wrong way. I hope I'm, thanks Joe. Yeah, that's real good. Um, But I I hope I'm doing a little bit better now. Maybe one out of two, maybe half my decisions are right. But if it were up to me, we wouldn't be going into an 83,000 square foot end zone building over here. We'd be going into a 25,000 square foot building on 29. Aren't you glad it's not all about you? That your decisions don't have ultimate control of your destiny. 
See, the Bible teaching is absolutely practical on this. How much do I control my destiny? How much is my future determined? The Bible does not say your choices have no connection to your destiny. Neither does it say your choices completely determine your destiny. The Bible teaches that God gives us choices and he allows them to affect our future, but he is in ultimate control. That's why Psalm, one, Psalm 11 is so comforting to us. It says, the Lord is in his holy temple. No matter what situation you find yourself in, you discover God is still on his throne. Therefore, we make decisions and we take action knowing that we are responsible for our choices and knowing that if we will seek him in prayer, if we will seek his wisdom, we will seek just to obey what's clearly the right thing to do, that he will direct our steps toward success. So God guides oxymoronically, 100% us, 100% him. Second, how does God guide? God guides slowly and subtly. The first question with the Adjustment Bureau may be, how much control do I have in my destiny and how much influence do my choices have? The real issue, as I was watching the movie Adjustment Bureau, the real question, the, the real wrestling match that David Morris had was, how much will I trust the chairman and his wisdom and his approach to love and how much will I trust myself? Take a look at this video clip. There's a whole world of women out there. Thought we established this one was off limits. Well, it's been a while, I must have forgotten. Doesn't change the fact. Who put us together three times? That wasn't us, that was just chance. Why do you want to keep us apart? Because the plan says so. Well, then you misread the plan. No, there's no misreading the plan when it comes to you and Elise. The plan's wrong. (laughs) Do you know who wrote it? I don't care. Well, you should. You should really show a little respect. If I'm not supposed to be with her, how come I feel like this? Isn't that the wrestling match of life? And as you're watching this movie, if you've seen The Adjustment Bureau, you find yourself rooting for David Morris to rebel against the chairman's plan because it's as though David Morris knows better than the chairman and he has a better understanding of what love is than the chairman. And you know what? He may because the chairman is not God. But isn't that the essence of our wrestling match in life? Okay, can I trust God? How much can I, am I gonna let God control my life um, and lead my life, especially when I find him confusing? See, the Bible does not promise that all things are gonna look good or feel good immediately when we try to follow God's plan for our lives. The Bible says in Romans 8, 28, we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose, The Bible promises that those who love God, all things work together for good eventually, but not immediately. God's will works slowly and subtly. So if you're gonna find God's guidance, the question is, will you trust him when he's slow or confusing or in the middle of the chaos when he doesn't seem to be working for your best? One of my best favorite examples from this from the Bible is Joseph in the Old Testament. When Joseph was a young man, God gives him a dream. And the dream is that you are going to be a man of great influence. You're going to be a leader. You're going to have power. So much so that people are going to come before you and they're going to bow before you. And what's God do next? Allows Joseph to be sold into slavery. And then sold into slavery, he is falsely accused of rape and he's thrown into prison. And in those 13 years of slavery and prison, Joseph had to be crying out to God, God, where are you? God, what about the plan? What about the dreams that you had for my life? God, you seem distant. You are definitely confusing. God, do you love me anymore? God, have you abandoned me? I don't know what's going on and how, diffi- how easy it would have been for Joseph at that point to think, I know better than God. I care about my life more than God. I know what love is even better than what God does. But years later, God's agenda is finally made obvious. And Joseph becomes the prime minister of Egypt. And in the process, not only does Joseph save Egypt, not only does he save the ancient Near Eastern world at that point from starvation, but he saves his own family as well. And here's the deal. It is not despite of the suffering of those 13 years. It is exactly because of the difficult things he went through in those years. 
We discovered that those bad events were all just training ground for Joseph. In slavery, he learned humility. In prison and in slavery, he learned leadership. He was able to hone his skills. He was able to use his gifts. He was able to build credibility. So that when the time came, he was able to function in the role that God had, the dream that he had for his life. But here's the, the deal. It was only in the end. That's why Joseph is able to say to his brothers in Genesis 50, verse 20, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good to bring it about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. That is almost an exact restatement of Proverbs 16, 1, the plans of the heart belong to man, but the answer of the tongue is from the Lord. So never, never, never think that God is not at work in your life. No matter what prison or trial you're going through. No matter how much he seems absent or distant or apathetic. And never, never, never you're going to figure out what God is up to in the middle of the story. It's always in the end. And here's the most difficult thing for, for us as human beings to hold on to. Many times in life, in the end, we'll never be experienced in our lifetime. We'll never understand it while we're still alive. So the challenge is in the middle of the battle, here's the challenge for us. Will we be David Morris and we feel like we know better than God, we love better than God, we care more than God, or will we be like Joseph who remains faithful and humble and submissive to God, even in the trial. See, how does God guide, really, is our next principle. So, so if God guides oxymoronically, and God guides um, slowly and subtly, then how do I find God's guidance? See, most of us, what we want is a formula. And the Bible can give us principles for finding God's guidance. But that's not how God works most of the time. Most of us, what we want is a sign. We want a magic eight ball that we can kind of, you know, just, just, uh, I forgot the magic eight balls, but a magic that we can just kind of shake and it says, sorry, you know, or yes, do it, okay? Or we want an emotion, we want a feeling that says, this, I have peace with this, and therefore it's right. So many people make bad decisions because they claim some kind of spiritual peace, Oh, it must be right because I feel good about it. It must be right because I feel at peace about it. Listen, if, if, if Jesus had been guided by feelings of peace, he never would have gone to the cross. He didn't feel at peace with the cross. He was sweating drops of blood. But that's what we want. Oh, I got a peace with God. Really? Can you really trust that? How do you know, how do you get God's guidance? Here's the first principle. You've got to pay the price. Proverbs 16.3 says, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Commit to the Lord whatever you do and your plans will succeed. Now, most of you just read that with dyslexia. That's how I read that, candidly. You know how most of us read it? Most of us read that if we commit our plans to the Lord, then what we do will succeed. That's probably what it says. Commit what you do commit your next step, commit your action to the Lord, and then what you plan will succeed. Why? Because in the process, he will make you in the kind of person that he can bless. In the pro process, he will, you will take action that will make you the kind of person who makes wise decisions in the future. That word commit literally means to roll over onto, to put all of your weight on. That is saying you unconditionally trust God with all that you do, and you will become the kind of person who succeeds, who makes wise plans. See, this is what it means to pay the price for guidance. It is the principle that the more you pay for advice, the more apt you are to listen to it, right? Go to a marriage counselor, pay $200 an hour, you're gonna be pretty motivated to listen to his advice. Bring a consultant into your company that you're paying $20,000, you're gonna be more motivated to listen to advice. On the other hand, when I was growing up, my parents gave me lots of free advice all the time that I felt pretty comfortable with, you know, rejecting, right? You gotta pay the price for wisdom. The more we pay for advice, the more apt we are to listen to it. This is what Elizabeth Elliot, the missionary, wrote. The guidance of God is different. 
First, we do not come to God asking for advice, but asking for God's will. That is not optional. And God's fee is the highest one of all. It costs everything. To ask for the guidance of God requires abandonment. No longer do we say, if I trust you, God, you will give me such and such, you will give me success. Instead, we say, I trust you, God. Give me or withhold from me whatever you choose. As John Newton says, what you will, when you will, how you will. Elizabeth Elliot says, finding God's direction is not a matter of saying, God, if I trust you, you will then lead me down a path to success. That's how you read the proverb at first blush. That's the attitude of David Morris. I will trust the chairman if he leads me down a path that makes me happy. No, she says, if you want God's guidance, you have to pray, God, I will trust you. Give me or don't give me whatever you choose. What you will, when you will, how you will. I shared that quote with my sister, Linda, this past week, and Linda said to me, um, said, you know what? And when you have those pockets in your life, when you really do trust and follow God in that way, that's when you discover that God really is good, that he really can be trusted. But that's not how we want God to guide us, is it? You know what we want from God, what I want from God? I want to be able to ask God, guide me, and then I want for him to give me the answer to my prayer. I want him to bring out the success real quickly. Have you seen the YouTube videos on how movies should have ended? There's a whole series of these, how Star Wars should have ended, how Lord of the Rings should have ended. If you go, go watch that one at home today, it's, it's a hoot. This is how The Wizard of Oz should have ended. It says that The Wizard of Oz should, should not, it could have ended as soon as Dorothy got into the Munchkin Land. She didn't even have to go down the yellow brick road. Isn't this kind of how you want The Wizard of Oz to end? Go ahead. Give me back my slippers. Be gone. You'll have no power here. Very well. I'll bide my time. And as for you, my fine lady, just try to stay out of my way. Just try. I'll get you, my pretty, and your little dog. Whoa, you killed her. How is it so? I thought only water could kill the witch foe. I thought so too, until that house killed one dead. Then I figured, we're carrying guns, so I shot her in the head. In the head? In the head. He shot her in the head. Well, ding dong, everybody. Another witch is dead. Ding dong, the witch has shot. Another witch is dead. Yeah. 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 Another witch is truly dead. Ding dong, the witch has shot. Well, this ruins my plan to send you on a journey and teach you a lesson and eventually have you kill the wicked witch yourself. Isn't that how we want things to happen in our lives? You know, we look at the story of Joseph, and we don't, don't want Joseph to have to go through 13 years of slavery in prison. I mean, why can't God give him the vision, send him to a couple of years of college, and then, and then make him prime minister? Or Job, you know? I, I, Job loses everything in chapter 1, and it's not until chapter 42 that it's like all, all of his prayers are answered, and he gets his stuff back. Are those 40-some chapters really necessary? I mean, can't we just like have two chapters of pain for Job and then, you know, we come to the mighty conclusion, the wonderful success, the, the, the fun, you know, results kind of thing? No. Why is it that God so often takes so much time? This is what it means to pay the price for God's guidance. See, God's primary purpose is not to make you and me successful or happy. His primary purpose is to build relationship with us and to build our character. And both of those t things happen slowly over time. See, we don't really learn how much God loves us until like Joseph, we feel abandoned by God and later experience that God didn't give up on us. You know, it's been seven years since we started, since we first took up an offering as a collection to build a building. Seven years. Why did it take so long? Why didn't God just do it in a year or two years?
because there was work that he was wanting to do in our relationship. And now we're able to look at him and say, look how good God has been to us, doing more than we could have ever asked or imagined. And we trust him more and we love him more as a result. That's what it means to pay the price. And while you can understand God's love for you and God's leading for you by reading it and hearing it, it is only through experience that he grabs your heart to trust him. And it's only through experience that he makes you wise. See, the key, the Bible does not, here's the thing that is going to be troublesome for you a little bit. The Bible does not talk so much about how God guides us as it does how we become the kind of people that he can guide just like Joseph needed those 13 years so he would be humbled. So we do as well. The Bible says in Proverbs 16, 3, commit your work to the Lord and your plans will be established. Proverbs 12, 15, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but a wise man listens to advice. See, before you go through pain, you're wise in your own eyes, but then you go through pain and what happens? You listen, you become humble. And as a result of that, you become wiser in the decisions that you make. I have said before, I don't know a more loving person necessarily than my sister, Linda. Linda seems to always be able to answer the question in any situation, what's the loving thing to do? She, her decisions are based on what's the loving thing to do, why? Because she's allowed God to mold her character in a way that she finds herself in situations, and she's not saying, now what's God's mysterious guidance in my life? She's asking What's the loving thing to do? And therefore, she does the godly thing. She makes a wise choice that God can bless because the Bible says love never fails. Or we see that when, um, like my wife, Laura. You know, when my wife, Laura, went to the lake that day, she had not been praying, God, send me the man of my dreams. But she had allowed God to, to develop in her a servant's heart. So when she found herself faced with a decision, will I serve myself or will I serve somebody else? She served somebody else and God blessed that decision by leading her to the man of her dreams. <laughs> See how it works? That's one of the great challenges of the Bible is, will you obey the Bible even when you disagree? Even when the Bible says, do things this way, but your feelings say, I don't want to do things that way. Even when culture says, this is right, and the Bible says, this is wrong. You're David Morris at this point, or you're Joseph at this point. Either at this point you say, I trust God, I believe God is wiser, I believe God is more loving, or you're David Morris and you say, I think I'm wiser, I think I'm more loving, okay? Remember that the next time you're going through your Joseph period, your Job period. God has not abandoned you. He's drawing you closer to him. Um, let me tell you, um, let me tell you t two stories about, about that. Um, this past week, I conducted the funeral for my mom's husband, Paul Betray, and, um, and I met one of his cousins by the name of Carol, Carol and Dave. He is a vice president in, at Rockwell in uh, Florida, huge house, wealthy family, beautiful couple, didn't know the Lord for most of their life. And then a few years ago, their son was in a car accident, and everybody else in the car accident was killed. And their son was in the hospital, and the doctors did not think that their son was going to live either, and they needed to pray, and they realized they did not know how to pray. Now, Carol had been taken to church a bunch when she was a little kid, but they hadn't been to church for a long time. So they called Paul, my mom's husband, because they knew Paul was a godly man, and so they asked Paul to pray, and Paul prayed. And as Paul prayed, they, they thought, if, if God can answer anyone's prayers, he's going to answer this man's prayers. And they realized, we want what Paul has. Now, the good news is their son did recover. The great news is they gave their lives to Christ, and now they are about the most on fire people for the Lord that you'll ever meet. They realized there was this huge hole in their heart spiritually. Even though they had everything else, power, money, leisure, they were really missing what mattered most. And now they have the Lord, and Carol is on fire. I mean, she's serving. She works with uh, women in troubled pregnancies, do mission stuff. I mean, they're just talking, trying to convince everybody, you need the Lord, you need the Lord, you need the Lord. I mean, it's just like sometimes it's like, whoa, slow it down. But why? Because God had to take them through the process had to take them through the Joseph process, the 13 years, the suffering, to realize their need for him. 
And now they do God's will because their hearts have been changed. They trust God now. Now here's, if, if I can take a next step, I didn't say this last service, somebody came up to me last service and said, you know, when I was first a Christian, it seemed like I got God's guidance all the time. There was a sense that God was leading me and signs and all this kind of stuff. So now I've been a Christian for a while and it's like, how do I figure out God's will? Because it seems like God's not doing that anymore for me. And some of you are at that point, you're saying, have I done something wrong? God doesn't seem to guide me like he once used to guide me. Here's the deal. It's kind of like my son Logan right now is 11 years old. And Logan comes to me at four o'clock in the afternoon and says, dad, can I go play outside? And I say, well, is your schoolwork done? Yes. Well, when's dinner? 5.30, okay. Now, where are you gonna play? You gonna play close to home? Yeah. Now, what about the kids that you're playing with? Are they good kids to play with? Yeah. Okay, then it's okay. Come on in by 5.30 for, for dinner time. Okay, he goes out and plays. Now, imagine, Joe, uh, imagine Logan is 20 years old and he's at college. It's four o'clock in the afternoon and he calls me on the phone. Dad, can I go outside and play? Yeah, what am I gonna say? I'm gonna say, What's wrong with you? You know, I mean, why are you calling me? I mean, you know what I mean? You need to ask the questions yourself. You need to assess. Do you have your work done? What are you going to do? Is it productive? You know, you need to think. Here's the deal. When we are young, spiritually, what God does often is he will handhold for us to help us understand. But as you mature, okay, God isn't spoon feeding you anymore. He expects you to mature. He expects you to know the Bible. He expects you to develop wisdom. He expects you to develop character so you can assess the situation and take responsibility for your choices. Okay? That's how God guides as you grow. It's not that he's abandoned you. It's that he wants you to grow up and have a healthy responsibility and uh, and independence. But when you come to that point, then you can trust that I can make decisions and I'm gonna do my best to follow God and he'll, he'll, he'll bless me. Here's the question then for you today. What is the clear next step of obedience that God has for you? Is there some place in your life with your time, treasure, or talents that you know God is saying obey and you're not obeying? Commit what you do to the Lord, your actions, that next step, and then your plans will succeed. Is there something that you are doing that you know God is not wanting you to do? Something he's trying to purge from your life with your talents, treasures, um, time. Then stop doing that. Commit what you do to the Lord and your plans will succeed. But then, once you are committed to following what is God's clear next step for you, you don't have to worry about the 10 miles down the road that you can't see. You commit to God's clear next step for you and trust that he will make you successful at the end. Uh, I heard recently that Charlton Heston in the movie um, Ben-Hur did not know how to drive a chariot. Many people believe that the the, the chariot scene in Ben-Hur is the finest action sequence in all movie history. Today it would be done with computer graphics. That day it was done with the real people and real horses and Charlton Heston himself drove the chariot. But, but, but Heston actually did not want to drive the chariot. He actually uh, protested to the director, William Wyler. He said, I may learn how to drive the chariot. He wasn't familiar with horses or chariot driving. He said, I may learn how to drive the chariot, but I'm not sure I'm going to be able to win the race. And William Wyler said, Heston, you just get into the chariot. I'll make sure you win the race. Commit what you do to the Lord and your plans will succeed. What is the clear next step of obedience? You don't have to be vexed about, am I going to live a purposeful life? Am I, am I going to succeed in what I do? What does God want me to do in 10 years from now? What you need to do is get into the chariot right now. What's the clear next step? And God will make sure you succeed. Let's pray together, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus, for your love for us. And um, God, I pray that you would help us to be your people, to follow your plans, and not to get so wrapped up in what we don't understand, but to, to just do what we clearly know and understand and to trust 
especially, Lord, in the middle of our Job and Joseph experiences, to trust that you're there and you have not abandoned us. It's through Christ we pray. Amen.